childhood because I was reading through a lot of the, your bio and I didn't know this and you can kind of speak to this, but coach, I didn't know you played football too, your, your first couple years of high school. <laughs> yeah, I played, well, my freshman year I did. It was kind of crazy. Uh, I got a chance to play, um, you know, because I, you know, playing at Herbert Hoover, Boys Club is where I grew up playing all my school sports. And uh, I, was a, I was a pretty outstanding running back as well as quarterback. And I got a chance because some of my teammates that I, you know, Darren White, Charlie Green, um, those guys were big time football players as well. And then I, uh, you know, ap after uh, my freshman year, you know, I got on the football field, man, and um, I was pretty spectacular. <laughs> you know, and they were like, well, you're going to do it. And, but Coach Gann asked me, stay off the football field and just stay on the basketball court. So I ended up not playing, uh, staying in the, you know, staying on the football field and just putting all my energy and uh, efforts into being the best basketball player I can be in high school. Mm -hmm. So, so when you talk about Herbert Hoover and I mean, just growing up in that area, like how, how was it? So was, were you mainly like just introduced to the game? Like how were you introduced to the game? Let's just put it like that. Like, was it something that, that just happened just, because everybody else was doing it, your older brother, siblings was playing. Like, how did you get introduced? What was your first time being introduced to the game? The game, okay. Well, I'll speak a little bit. Are you speaking basketball or are you talking about football and basketball, sports? Well, and basketball and then sports in general, because I wanted okay. to all tie in because I think this 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 generation, a lot of it is kind of like, you know, we, we're sports specific at a certain age and not a, a lot of us play a lot of different things to just see what we're good at early, you know? Well, so that. Well, with the basketball point is, is uh, my brother Henry, uh, Henry Leonard is, uh, he's two years older than me. And uh, we, we all grew up, we grew up on uh, Grand and Greer, which is right down the street. You can walk right down up the street, actually, and jump the gate and be in the Herbert Hoover Boys Club backyard. So uh, as a little guy, uh, I used to grow up walking around in the neighborhood. We had uh, a friend named Dwayne Armstrong that had a basketball court in his backyard. He lived on Sullivan. And as uh, Alan DeLoach, who was like a, uh, you know, one of my big brothers growing up and really close with my brother Henry. Our neighborhood guys, we had basketball courts that we put up on, uh, in the backyards, on the garages. And uh, one, uh, on Sam Hopkins' backyard, we had a, a milk crate. We cut the bottom out the milk crate. You know, we played with a little ball. And so as a little guy, I was always in the alleys, getting bumped around, getting scratched up, but I always hung out with the older guys, um, guys two and three years older than me, four and five years older than me, uh, uh, starting as a little guy. So we used to have our, our neighborhood rivals where Greer plays against Dodia, and we go in the backyard and, and you know, and I'm mm. the only little guy out there, but I'm out there scrapping. And one thing I could do is I can handle the ball and I was quick. So, you know, they would let me play even though I was younger. And as we grew older to start going into Herbert Hoover, uh, as, as I stated, we had a gentleman, A.C. Akers. Uh, A.C. was a, a, a guy that grew up in the boys club and we had Mr. Pierce. Um, and uh, they saw something in me at a young age where, you know, I was aggressive, you know, I was real self-starting. So I just pursued playing the sports. And my brother Henry, as I say, was two years older than me. And I always played on the older team and uh, I used to do very well in the basketball games. When I was 12, I'm playing with the 14-year-olds. I'm scoring 15 to 16 points a game. And then all of a sudden, that turned into me really starting to buy into saying, hey, I can play this game. I, I really want to focus in on basketball. But as you know today, Brian, the kids that receive the training that we give kids, we bless kids with today, we didn't have those people back in those days giving us that that attention, that individual attention, uh, teaching us those individual skill sets that we're blessed to teach young kids, men and women today. Uh, so you kind of picked it up on your own. Um, mm -hmm. And through Herbert Hoover, I was very, very aggressive. Uh, I've always played with older kids, as I stated. And, um, you know, that's kind of how I got my start in playing sports. But I've always played with older guys. And I, and I was really good at it. I was a really good ball handler. Uh, and, you know, and that compelled me to just being really good and, and little league uh, basketball. 
So even just playing with older guys, as far as did, did you make the commitment to playing on an organized team early? And, and what age did you start playing organized as far as like being able to play in like real live games with referees and different things like that? So when did that get started? Well, that started for me when I, uh, at Herbert Hoover, I, I actually boxed for a while. Uh, we had Henry, the late Henry Armstrong was, a uh, 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 he was the boxing coach at Herbert Hoover. I mean, Herbert Hoover was a, um, was a safe haven for our community. Uh, we had a lot of talented young men and, uh, and women that grew up. Uh, we started a cheerleading program for the lady side, my sister, Sandra, may she rest in peace. Uh, her and her girlfriends got started and we started a cheerleading program that supported us in all the sports, basketball as well as football. But when I, when I got started in basketball, I was 14 years old and um, we had uh, this uh, Herbert Hoover team that we had was a traveling team. And we had combined our team with this Todd Dutton. I don't know, he used to coach years ago at uh, Riverview High School. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dad, Coach Dutton. Mm -hmm. Coach Dutton used to have, his dad used to have a cookie store a cookie for whatever and, you know all wow. i know is he used to bring us cookies all the time so we would look forward to playing against the the, the zoom team that they played and i played at herbert hoover and we had we'd ha we would have our battles um we played against harold webster with the trotters i remember those days when you know I, I, as a little guy every time i played them i seemed like i would get 38 points every time i played them 38 points it never so, so, felt 38 hold, points every hold, time hold I played on coach them. So, so you first started playing organized at 14? At 14 years old is when I really started playing organized basketball. That is correct. Wow. Wow. 13, man, so, 13 But, but I mean, that's, 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 I mean, not, not to say that that's crazy because I mean, a lot of, a lot of us are late bloomers and I see a lot of folks that put their kids through a lot of different things uh, early at like, you know, first and second grade, and they may not even love the game or even love playing. But just to hear that, you know, somebody like yourself and your caliber and, and all the accolades that you ended up receiving, you really got serious with it around eighth grade, ninth grade, making that transition into high school. So and I know now, you know, people right now are already gearing up to, you know, uh, prepare themselves to pick the high school that they wanted to go to. Did you already know that since I lived in the neighborhood that I'm going to go to Central? Were you were you introduced to the high school game? in the eighth grade? Like, was it something as far as uh, you looking forward to going to see, you know, the rival games uh, in town? Like, were you introduced to the high school scene at all? Well, it's funny you say that. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't introduced to the high school rivalries or games or anything like that. But what I was fortunate to have an experience in my, you know, for two years, I went to the EYSP, I can't, I'm trying to think of the initials, don't let me mess it up, but it was out of Harris Stowe State College where Marvin Niels, who was the coach at Sodan during those times, mm -hmm. uh, ran that program, and every year I would go to that program, and, you know, I would get a chance to play with the, you know, Bless Souls and David Third Kills, you know, mm -hmm. I got a chance to play with those guys that didn't even know how talented they were or, or, or their walk at that time because I was a young kid and I was just getting involved in basketball, but I was pretty good at it. And, you know, but when, and I, I lived in Central District, so, you know, therefore uh, Ringo Taylor, John Taylor, we call them ghosts. These guys, I used to go down to Veshon as an eighth grader and play with these guys and, you know, and have success playing with older guys and they would pick me. And that's when I knew that if they took a chance on picking me at a young age, they must have saw something in me that feel like I can be on that court playing with those guys that are three and four and five years older than me. Uh, but a, a lot of it was because I was really fast and quick. I can guard real well and I can get the ball up the floor and get it to somebody. So that's, that was my strengths and they used me for that. But, um, wow. uh, but doing Herbert Hoover, like I said, when I decided to, to say through and Herbert Hoover, uh, I don't want to skip this because this is very important. Richard Hamilton, which is Bird Hamilton, uh, who coached you in high school, you know, and I was blessed to coach you as well. I'm pretty sure we'll touch on some of those things later, but Richard Hamilton saw me and I knew, uh, and then I asked, who is this big guy that always come in the gym? He would stand in the doorway and he would watch me play. And he'll just say, good game, little fella. And he would leave out. And I couldn't understand, you know, who is that guy? He stand, but he, he would come periodically and see us play. And he was watching me. And he was, you know, telling me about my high school coach, which was Jim Gant, 
uh, at Central High School. And then I had other high schools pulling at me, thinking about, hey, if you want to go here and that, but you know, I stayed in the district. My parents mm -hmm. wanted me to stay at Central High School. I was three blocks from Central High School. I walked to school every day. Um, and I, I decided, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to follow Mr. Bird Hamilton. That's my big brother today. I love him. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and ain't nothing he can do about it. And um, I said, I'm going to follow Bird's footsteps. I'm going to go to Central. I'm going to be that I want to be that a big time star like him because I, I did my homework. I found out what he, did, you know, what he was accomplishing at his days at Central High School prior to me coming, and then I had an opportunity that summer to play for the KTZ All Stars, mm. Dr. Jockenstein, the radio personnel. <laughs> it's it's funny, time right? For Jock, uh, yeah. Jockenstein. You, 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 yeah. yeah, remember that? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the roll call, all that. I mean, I'm I playing for the KTZ. You know, Eddie OJ, Randy OJ, I'm playing with these guys. Uh, Jim Gates, may rest in peace. Um, I'm playing with these guys as an eighth grader and we're traveling around different parts of the metropolitan area playing. And I'm putting up astronomical numbers, 40 and 50 points in games as an eighth grader grade going to high school. And, you know, so that's just kind of catapulted my energy towards saying, hey, this basketball is something I really wanted to do, although I was really good in football. Um, and we played a, the KTZ All-Stars played a game against a Central High School senior class. Okay. Uh, they had sellers who played in the NFL, played at Kansas, played in the NFL. All those guys were on that team, on that, on that uh, alumni game team. And so Coach Gant got his first opportunity to put his eyes on me in that game. And I think I scored 42 or something like that. I really went off. Eighth grade. I, eighth grade. Playing with grown men. I went off. I think I scored 42 in that All-Star game. And Coach Gant was like, you know what? You come, you know, and he, he was, from that point on, he kept eyes on me because, you know, again, Mr. Niels was a great friend, great guy. I loved playing. Mr. Niels was trying to tell me, hey, you know, I had Marty Worth, a good friend that played at Sodan. Hey, you come over here and play with us. You know, Troy Taylor, who played at Sodan. And I like, you know, I'm going to stay at my high, you know, my, my local mm -hmm. high school and I stayed at, at Central High School. So at that point, and that's why I said, again, asked me not to go play football because I was really good at football. Uh, but he asked me not to uh, to play. So that's kind of how it got going for me. Yeah. So and I had this conversation with uh, uh, Earl Austin Jr. And we were just talking about just, you know, we took pride back in the day of, uh, again, playing with older guys and then being 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 picked up by a, a old like even grown men and that honor that that you you know you felt you you felt bestowed upon you oh I'm getting picked up with the older guys and I bet not mess this up so we start right. to you know you start to have a, a, a meaning for why you playing and and wanting to play winning basketball all the time and so we, he brought up a good point in you know in this generation, it's so many games being played. Like if you go, you travel, and we'll talk about this at, at the grassroots level, you may play a game Friday when you get in town, two or three games Saturday, and then two games on Sunday to where the possessions don't really mean a whole lot. But if you're getting picked up by those older guys and you got 20 guys on the sideline and we know we got this youngster on our team, you better not mess this up, young fella, because this might be the last time you get back out here if you want to continue to come up here to this to this park and play on this court with us you know would, would you say that that pressure was like that when you when you grew well, up that that pressure was always there and and the thing about it is the humbling thing about it is uh the fact that the older guys that played the game the guys that were good at the game really saw enough in you to to give you the opportunity to be out there to play with them because most of the times when you're young you know, they want to kick the young fellas off to the other court. You know, there's, you know, this is a big boy court. But when you feel like, you know, when when you felt like one of the guys, when they made you feel like, yo, you deserve to play here, you know, let's get let's get it in. Let's, you know, let's get down. Let's get let's get let's get busy. That's the kind of that's the kind of drive that I I kind of I I needed to to make me realize that being at at five, seven and a half, five, eight, to be good, you know, being a small guy. It was a place for me in this game because a lot of times you see basketball, you don't think of little guys being a significant part. But uh, I had a role, um, you know, converting right back to my high school years with Central High School. We, my junior year, we averaged 115 points a game without a three-point line. 
Man, I was just about to I was just about to talk about that, coach. And I, yeah. I want and I wanted you to kind of clarify a lot of these things that, that I saw. And I'm just looking and I'm just like, like, hold up, this 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 can't be right. So your junior year, and again, you you talk about the the great central teams. And even when I conversated with, with Bird, he he talked about the two different styles and eras that Central mm-hmm. had. His his group had a lot of the big tall guys, and they had the big boys. They had right. a big front front line of guys that came off the bench. And then he said when he came back and watched you guys play, you was at the head of that press and was just taking guys' ball as soon as they they brought the ball in bounds, mm-hmm. yeah. snatching it right on up. So you guys were playing with a faster pace as opposed to them being able to just come down and walk the ball down and throw it into the post. So what was the transition like going into preparing for something like that? Because I mean, first of all, you have to be in shape. You have to have guys bought into where, you know, you know, you are capable of putting up 30 and 40 every night, but then you also know there's other guys on the team that can possibly do the exact same thing. Did you guys play together all the way in the summertime to get ready for that next season? Like take me through those steps of what, what was it like transitioning from your first couple years until your junior year? And then we'll talk about junior year real quick. Well, you know, it's funny you said that as a freshman uh, in the year that uh, Bird senior year, uh, I was a freshman on varsity. Coach Gant moved me up. Uh, my brother was a uh, junior in high school. He was on the varsity team. Uh, but as, you know, again, because of the experience and, uh, you know, of playing the game, playing with older guys. I got an opportunity to play varsity as a freshman. And um, that team, like you say, that bird at 6'5 was the point, point forward. Uh, uh, Spearman was 6'4. You know, Reggie Claiborne was 6'3, 6'9, 6'8. Uh, Terry Rice, you know. Yeah, Johnny Parker too, right? Johnny Parker was a little bit before me. Parker was the year before me. I mm-hmm. came in when Parker graduated. Um, but, uh, you know, Arthur McFadden, they were a year before. So when I came in, they left. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but it, it's just amazing how, how they played, the, the two, three zone. They would play some man, but they were so big, they walk it down and they pound you and they, you know, they use their size as an advantage. Uh, and as a freshman playing with, with that, you know, I, I'm, I'm behind, I'm playing right behind Daryl Allen and uh, Reggie Claiborne, those guys. And I used to get after them so much in practice. So Gant, I felt had a vision of how he was going to use when I came in as a sophomore, because my sophomore year, 79, we had a teacher strike. So right, school right. was mm-hmm. going to strike. So we, we didn't really get a chance to finish the season. So and you uh, couldn't practice at, at schools, right? You couldn't use the facilities. That's cool. But you know, time is in the past. Now we used to <laughs> <laughs> and, and we we get in there and work, but you know the, the you said something that's more important than that. You talked about when you state when you when you spoke on this, you talked about us developing how to go from being that big team that Central had to that little fast defensive team that I incorporated when I came in. And it's funny you asked that because there was guys like Darren White, may he rest in peace, Harry Ballard, who's my best friend today. Uh, uh, Greg Claiborne, um, you know, Joe Cannamore, Rodney Ruffin, you know, we, we had a team um, of guys and we would get together and play. We would go and play in neighborhoods and go play against us and beat them. And, and in the summer, Jody Bailey, bless his soul, may he rest in peace. Jody Bailey had a summer league, high school summer league, and I, it was mandatory. I made sure that every one of my players, we can only have three on the, on the team together, but everybody in my, on that team played in that summer league. And we would compete against each other because we can only, only be three on the team. We compete against each other. We pe- com- compete against all the other high school players that played in that, that uh, high school league. And when we came back, you know, the rest was history because we, we, we had a hunger. We paid with passion. We respected the game first and foremost. And the leadership, you know, I would give myself some cre- a lot of credit for that because they held me accountable. Uh, my coach held me accountable. Coach Gant held me accountable. And I made sure that if, 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 if guys had problems getting rides, that was no excuse. Get to the gym. If you need us to get it, Darren White would have a car. We'll get a car. We go pick. And we made and we stayed in that gym and we kept working. So when we came together in high school, the chemistry, it just clicked like clockwork. So, I mean, we Co- just, Coach, I- 
How did how did you develop that mentality though? Because I feel like a lot of times that's what that's what's missing from a, a lot of kids when you when you talk about just being good and then being great to where you you said, look, I'm gonna take this on myself and there's no excuses, but you developing or, or you already establishing yourself, not just as the best player, but as that general. Like how, how did you develop that? Was that was that did that come from the playgrounds or did you see like how, how did you develop that? You know, I think a lot of it had to do with my my upbringing, my parents, my dad, Henry Leonard, and my mother, Kirstine Leonard, may they both rest in peace. They instilled things in me, my brother, my sister, early on about, you know, and it's something that we carried on in life. And I use it a lot of times with a lot of the young men that I coached during these years, RCC responsibilities, choices, and consequences. We all deal with them every day in life. It's our responsibility to be the best person we can be. You know, whatever that is, you know, what that responsibility ties in, getting up, going to work. The choice is yours, whether you're going to go to work, get on, get up, be on time, you know, make it happen. Consequences, good or bad, the person in the mirror, you have to face that. And that's something that they instilled in us at a young age. Uh, and then when I went to high school, before uh, Mr. Purdy took over, as I, uh, he was leaving as the principal out of Central, Mr. Spicer, he came up with the RCC, but it just so happened that that's something that my dad and mom instilled in us early on. And never start something you don't finish. And if you're going to, my dad said, if you become a trash man, you be the best trash man you can possibly be. You know, don't, don't worry about anyone else, just control your destiny. If you put time and energy into it, give it your all, don't shortchange it. And those were values that, that was instilled in us at a young age and that kind of carried on through my life. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, so you, you developed that you had the guys playing on, on the Jody Bailey summer team. And so you guys already are starting to click. You see the commitment from the other guys on the team and they watching you because they saying like, man, if we know that if he doing it, it ain't no excuse why we shouldn't be able to do it. And you also leading by example, you know, and you being able to put up the points, but then you dedicated and showing guys, look, you have to be in this. There's no excuse. Everybody is going to play. And so you transition at the beginning of your junior year. Y'all start off the season, the first five games, averaging 123 points. Like, yeah. like what, what, what? <laughs> I mean, crazy. was you shocked the first couple games? Or Because or, I'm looking at some of these scores, Coach, man. You, Y'all had 166 points in one game. Yeah. And you told the you told the guy in the paper with a serious face that I think we could have scored 200. Yes. With no yes. smirk whatsoever. We actually, we actually stalled the fourth quarter. That wasn't fair. We're not going to even exploit the team. You know, we can have fun with it. But we stalled. We actually, Coach Gant, actually, you know, Coach was like, well, you know, I'm like, well, no, Coach, we can't do it. We're going to hold up a little bit. And we actually held the ball the fourth quarter, not to score 200 points. That's how, but it came because we had a killer instinct. We played with a lot of intensity, tenacity. We respect when we guard it. Coach, I mean, we, our DNA was defense. We like to get man to man. We press you and we get up in you and we go out. I mean, we, we had some tough nosed guys, you know, um, you know, I think about uh, Darren White, may he rest in peace. And we called him double D. I mean, this guy, was the all you know he was an all-star football player quarterback uh, he was a heck of a uh, baseball player catcher uh, he, he, he knocked the cover off the baseball he just was an all-around basketball I mean athlete you know hell of an athlete mm -hmm. man uh, we just had tough guys he would dunk on people and I'm not going to repeat some of the things he would say after he dunk on you but you would know it I mean we played at Vishon the guy do a reverse backwards dunk and break the rim they had to Pause the game for 30 minutes to put a boat back in the backboard. I mean, we 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 played with that kind of energy and tenacity, and it 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 fundled through me all the way through. Harry Ballard, we I, you know I look at these guys shooting NBA threes now. Harry Ballard used to come down the floor and fire it up from Israel. I call it, and it's nothing but nets. But Harry wasn't good going to his left, but if you let him go right, you in trouble, and he will pull up and just knock it down. It was like a layup. So we, you know, in the top of the key, I made a living there. I mean, you know, you got the game. I can hear the fans saying, and I let it go, whoosh, when it go through. Because they know, Coach Pee Wee Gray, let it go at the top of the key. So those were layups for, for me because I put time and energy on playgrounds and gyms mm -hmm. working. I would go up to SLU 
and play with, like I say, John Taylor, Ringo. They would take me, Marshall Rogers. I was a little guy, Hassan Houston. I'm playing against all these top guys around the city to mm -hmm. keep my game sharp, for them to go at me, to push me around, throw me to the floor, whatever it took. Because I realized if, you know what, if I can sustain myself against them, I can sustain myself against anybody. And that's the mindset that I instilled in our team and our players. Man, because like I said, I'm, I'm just looking at and seeing the the type of mentality and you kind of hit on it, just having that 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 killer instinct in a, as a collective, as a whole team, because, you know, you regardless, I don't care how, what type of team you playing against or what type of team that you think you have, that's a lot of points to be scored in a high school game, like with, with no three point line. Now, now the, for, for the <laughs> folks that's listening and watching, it's no three point line. That's the thing, B. You know, when you say that, Brian, you know, and I coach you and you were a hell of a talent. You no, know, um, just think of playing at the speed we played with at, you know, without a three point line and hitting those points at that, at, at, at that level. I mean, it, it brings back, you know, I, I don't think no one will ever do it again. I mean, if, if, if it was a three point line in my air, I don't know what we would have averaged as a team because everybody could score the ball, you know, Rodney Ruffin, you know, we call him Rod Smooth. He can put it on the floor. He was real agile on the baseline. Donald Davis, Duck, Duck we call him Duck. He was 6'5". He was really the tall, uh, well, Antonio Smith was about 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, uh, Michael Marlin, may he rest in peace, was about 6'5", but he was a football player. But we didn't have a real tall team. Joe Cannamore was our center at 6'3". But he jumped so high, it, and he coached years at Normandy and Roosevelt yeah, I know, High School. I know Mr. Cannamore. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, but we played with such passion. And Charlie Green was the all-star, all-American wide receiver in football. We would put him at that half court in that one three one press, and he was so quick. Him and Hario, Joe, uh, uh, Greg Claiborne played the wing, and Greg Claiborne was left-handed, and he was about 6'3". And he was really put together. He was thick and he had a left hand chopper. I call that in that jumper, that chopper. And everybody could score the ball. I mean, he could, we could really shoot the basketball. But the key was that we knew that in order to have fun offensively, we only way we was going to get these opportunities, we had to bend over and guard. And we took possessions from teams. I'm talking mm -hmm. about not just the teams that we blew out real bad, but when we played against Sodan, I remember Sodan winning the uh, Dismet tournament. And we played them at first game in the PHL at Vishon High School. And, you know, Sodan had a real good team. Earl, Earl, may he rest in peace, uh, was the guard. And uh, Troy Taylor, uh, Eddie Beckton, 6'8". They had a big team, and they, they had just won that dismat tournament. So they walk into Vishon, you know, and they played against us, and they were thinking, okay, we're going to get – we're going to go at Central. We're going we're to stop the show. No, no, brother. No, no, no. Didn't happen, man. We went at those guys. We beat them 118 to 88. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, and we just we just we just didn't care. That year alone, we gave Sodan three three losses by 30 points. And they end up winning state my senior year. Mm -hmm. They won state. They beat this met. This met the one sent us home. I have to say that. Um, and I don't I don't always agree. I had to deal with my college coach, Coach Grower, and some of the alumni from Dismet all the time, but uh, I'm pretty sure we may talk about some of that a little later. But uh, it was uh, it was tough. But we had a high school team that I don't think we'll see a team like that around here in a, in a long time. Mm. So, and, and then I'm just looking at uh, now, even like today, uh, and, we, and we talked about some of the leagues that were going on in the summertime, like like Jody Bailey, uh, and, and like you said, everybody. It, it was it was kind of up to to you or leaders if you know exactly what type of team that you envision on having. You got to make sure that you're working on your game all year round, all year round. And I just look at a lot of you know we talk we we talk sports specific with a lot of uh, kids nowadays to where you know they hone in on skill. And I feel like nowadays more than ever, I think our kids nowadays are so skilled because they get into training, you know. And I feel like I feel like we we play more as opposed to the skill work, you know. Uh, so and then transitioning to that, how do you view the uh, the the game or, or or how talk about how in tune you are with the high school game right now as far as as, as development? Do you think that is good for 
the kids to uh, concentrate mainly on, on just skill work or should they be trying to incorporate like their whole team when they're doing things in the summertime? Well, that, that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a question that a lot of people have posed and I, and I get that from a lot of my parents today. The skill work is good. You know, skill work is good. You know, there's a lot of guys that are training, teaching kids different, different skill things. But the one thing you cannot, you know, one thing we can't lose through all this skill work is that the concept of team. There's no, there's no I in team. Us, we are together. I tell, I use that with our BBE program when I'm around the guys. Um, and, you know, we got some remarkable young coaches that are, you know, coming up doing the program, you know, you, for a while you stepped in and helped them doing the program, but you know, you can't lose the concept of team, teamwork. Um, and, you know, I once had a player that told me, I told him there's no iron team, but he said, but there's an iron win. I say, okay, well, when you can go out there and do it by yourself, let me know. Okay, so you have to understand that the team concept comes into play. You have to be able to implement that skill set, and uh, uh, that you 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 went out and earned. And you know, because I'm not against any kid that goes out and work on that game, but you know, and when and I I will and challenge all my trainers when you train kids, explain to them, you know, making a skill move, a side step, step back, and all the cute stuff. That's one thing, but if I'm coming off a double screen, you know, and and I'm funneling a guy uphill. And that guy, he's got to be able to read and understand what comes out of it. He got to be able to teach guys how to see two or three plays in advance before that play happens. So when I train, I do a lot of teaching. When we come off and you get to that elbow, now what happens on the help side? What happens on the defense? What's your teammate supposed to be? What are you looking for when you come off that screen? Not just that shot all the time. It might be a drop down, a screen or a slip screen where you drop it to the big guy. You get that guy to help weak side, kick it to your shooter you know, or go directly at that shooter. I train that way when I talk to kids so they can understand how to utilize the skill set in the training when they're on the floor and how to incorporate right. it in the game as they play the game. Some people just train to get kids skilled things and things that look cute and things. To go, and that's fine. I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone that does that. But to me, it's got to make sense. Everything you do on that floor, there's a purpose behind it. Right. And that's how I train my kids. Mm -hmm. So, when I see kids that kind of go off the rail, when you see guys, you know, trying to emulate some of the NBA guys and all that, remember, these are NBA guys. These right. are not, you're not an NBA guy yet. That's where the humility comes in. You put your head down, keep working, keep working on the skill work, and eventually it'll pay off for you, especially if that's what God has for you. The talent's going to speak for itself. But great players make everybody on that floor better. And that's what I always tell my players. If you want to make a difference, you got to be a guy that's got the skill set that create things. When I need you to get a bucket, that's one thing. But when I need you to make a play, you got to be that guy that can go out there and make a play for us. And and the kids, the morale picks up off of you and what you do and what you bring to the team and what you bring to the floor at that time. So I'm really big on the skill stuff, yes, but and let kids know what what how to how to make things happen off of the things that you're training, these skill moves. And when you get to the sweet spot, what to look for, how, you know, how to make a play, how to make everybody else benefit from your skill set. And, and I don't want to like overshadow, like just your, your whole high school career as far as the, the things that you've, you've accomplished. I, you know, me personally, I feel like you, you've, you've done so much for the game in your years after playing that speaks more than, than anything that, that could happen around St. Louis, because I feel like pretty much the who's who of St. Louis at some form or in some way you have touched in a positive way moving forward. And so when you talk about those things as far as, you know, being able to have kids at, and when you're training them, read the defense, read what's going on out there, you're going to prepare them once they move past you and go to the next level. So they more prepared at the college level, you know, because ultimately when you think of the college level, it's just a higher thinking of basketball. And if, if your youth coach or if anybody at a young age didn't teach you these things at a young age, you're not going to be successful at that next level. So speak to that as far as you preparing and getting guys ready for the next level. What, what went into or what goes into that as a coach preparing kids for, for the next level? Well, I think, you know, and that's a good, that's a very good point, B. Um, it's, it's important, first of all, for the, the guys that are in front of these kids 
to have that humility as well. Uh, I've seen kids come in my gym when training. They'll come in and I have a lot of parents call me and say, you know, can you, uh, if, if you have a spot where my kid can come in and work out in the training and I'm, I never turn any kids down. The blessing is if you can get some gym space because, you know, doing COVID right now, things are a little tough for people. But I get in the gym and I'll see a kid with a lot of talent. They'll come in and they can show me a step back and they can show me how they can go between their legs. But then when I ask them to show me a triple threat, they don't even know how to do a simple triple threat. But then I think about all these individuals that are putting their hands on these kids prior to me even seeing them. And I'm asking myself, what are you doing to really help this kid grow? not putting you down, want to put that on your mind so you can understand. If we don't, the basics, if the foundation is solid, we can always build on a solid foundation, okay? You know, some kids are just blessed with talent. You know, you, right. you have those. But the, those those ones that need that direction, that need that solid foundation underneath them so that they can build from that standpoint. You know, they can build from that. Um, you know, it's, um, <laughs> I tell people, hard work, always outwork talent that don't work hard. You've seen it in the NBA. I've challenged guys to think about when they think about some of the top talent in the NBA that plays, and you look like a Dame Lillard, he wasn't a top 100 kid. George, uh, Paul George wasn't a top 100 kid. Mm -hmm. Kawhi Leonard wasn't a top 100 kid. Steph Curry wasn't a stop, top 100 kid. John Somebody, Morant. John, look at John Morant. Came from... Mm -hmm come from Murray State. Uh, Murray State. Murray State. No one would have thought he'd have been the pick he was in the NBA draft. Mm -hmm. But that just, that just tells you if you put your head down, and again, most people don't even know where uh, Dame Lillard went to college. Right. As good as he is. Weber State and Utah. No one would know that. But that kid put his head down. He come from Oakland and he put the work in. And when you put that work in, that's them labels don't mean anything. You know, when I think about the talks I used to have with Tatum and, and our Brads and our David Lees, you know, I've been blessed to touch a lot of those guys from Anthony Bonner, who's my guy, brother, um, all the NBA guys that, that have come to our program. A lot of, I've been blessed to touch a lot of lives I have and, and to be a part of it. But the, the, the thing I always told them, when you put that X on your back, the X is not going to leave. Now you got to earn, you, you want to, you want to keep that, you want that label? That comes with a price and you got to always be on ready set go always because everybody named mama gonna get you're gonna get everybody's a game so that's right. a mindset and there's days you're going to be successful there's days you don't but what are you going to do you get back in the lab and you put that work in and you continue to work so you know and speaking about how you know to the point you you raised earlier about how these high school guys how the game is today with these kids with all this skill stuff and all that, I really am big on making sure kids understand when to use and how to use those things to make everybody on that floor benefit from your skill set, your blessing that you have with that skill set. Mm -hmm. Being able to just go to your toolbox when, whenever the situation calls for it, you know, it may, it may cause for a step back in some situations. It may cause for something, a rip through, you know, off one leg in certain situations to be able to jump before another guy jumps to try to block his shot. So being able to just know when to use those things. When is, is Because a, a lot of kids go use them as rip and step ways and they <laughs> ain't no reason man, to do it right now, but that's gonna, just something they didn't work on. So they want to show you that they didn't work on it, right? Man, yeah. they're going to do it all in one, in, on one possession and in, 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 on one handle, but uh, but but I just know from just like I said, just off example of, of you preparing, I felt like I learned so much skill wise from just, you know, and, and you coached me at a young age, 11, 12, and, and I shared some of those pitches when we were young, but uh, you've done that for so many, so many players in this, in, uh, in this area that, you know, once, once they, we finally put it together, it's kind of like, oh man, I know what coaches is, is actually talking about right now and like you said what's real important is that that solid foundation and making sure that you surrounding yourself with folks you know uh, uh some of us or coaches or you know we can get you to a certain place but then you have to you know have some humility and make sure that when it's time to pass them on to someone else that you know no yeah. no no faults will, will, will come about but he has to get you ready now 
you know, and I, I feel so comfortable with where, where Yuri is at right now, as far as being able to, and being blessed to coach him for oh, four oh, years and so, saying like, now, you know, it's, it's up to you now to continue to work, continue to put your head down and continue to work on your game. How, how was, how was your thought process in picking a college, uh, coming out of high school? Uh, how, how did you, you know, formulate and think about like, I want to, I want to go play for this coach. Was it based on the program, the, the way that the coach uh, played the, the, the players around. So what went into that process? And if a kid is listening right now, how, how to narrow their search down to picking the right school that fits them? Well, um, my, my process was, was a little bit, it was a little strange because again, like I said, the way things are today with the relationships and you know technology and things of that nature, we didn't have that when I came up. You know, right. um, uh, a lot of you know my high school coach uh, was you know received all the contacts from all the schools and had some relationship with some of the coaches around the country. Uh, and then by you being a talent, you know, I, I went to this camp before the Nike camp was this big thing. We had a camp called BC Camp. And it was in Rensselaer, Indiana, Rensselaer, Indiana. And uh, they had uh, they had uh, asked me to come out and, and play in this camp. And I was a little reluctant to doing it because, you know, I was the only kid that they asked from St. Louis to participate in this. And, you know, I was a Streets and Smith All-American, all of those little things when we were coming up and, you know, first team all district and Metro and all that, that's one thing. But to go out and play against these top talent around the country, Right. You know, I wanted to get the experience, but I chose, I didn't want to go by myself. I, I said, well, if I can take someone with me uh, that they viewed as another top player in our area, who could it be? Uh, and, you know, some of my high school guys didn't, you know, they, they chose not to do it at that point. Darren played baseball, Legion baseball, which is high select baseball. And he was one of the kids I talked to about doing it. So I went to Troy Taylor that played at Sodan High School. And I said, hey, Troy, if I can get you to go to this camp and they'll get you in and, and you know, pay our way fees in and let us participate, would you go? And Troy Taylor said, yes. So we went down to Rensselaer, Indiana. We rode a bus and they left at the, at the hotel where they were supposed to come pick us up. They left us there for about two or three hours. And then they finally came and got, oh man, we left the, the St. Louis guy. So they came and got us and Troy and I got there at dinner time. we ate and then, uh, you know, we went out and, and played. And at that camp, uh, you, like I said, that's was your top players. That was a guy named Lester Rowe that played at West Virginia, about 6'5". Oh, he was, a, I've never seen, I mean, you talk about Dominique and David Thompson, the way those guys jump, this guy could really get off the floor. And uh, I, I had an opportunity to play with him and they brought me in and they put me on this team and they were impressed with the fact that I would get the ball and because the way we played in high school, I didn't dribble because I was little. I used to advance the ball up the floor with the pass. I used to push the ball up the floor, put that pressure on the defense. And this guy had like three straight dunks, hellacious dunks, they, you know, and they came over to me. And then that that media, now that's when all the scouts were in the gym and coaches and right. stuff. So that was my first experience. When you talk about my selection of school, that's, I'm talking about that camp because that camp was my eye opener. So I, I got University of Virginia. I got University of Georgia. I got all these big time schools looking at me. And here I am, this five, eight guy from St. Louis, you know, not used to that kind of experience. Not, not you know, don't know anything about the, all that media attention. Right. And I'm an, I make top five of the camp. I'm top five of the camp that year. And I'm like, wow, Troy made top 25. So we went down there with that Missouri toughness. And they were like, you know what? These Missouri got some basketball players. They got some stuff, and here I am, little Pee Wee Leonard, you know. And and I make the top five of that camp. And Scott Brooks, who now coaches in the NBA, I'm, he's a counselor at that camp, and I'm going at him. I'm going right. I'm getting at him. You know, we had we battling right. And um, JJ Anderson that played at Bradley played in the NBA. These guys, so they say, okay, you made top five. They tried to get me to convert from that camp to go to Millersville, Georgia, to meet Dominique Wilkins. Now, I don't know Nick at this time. I don't know Dominique. I ended up playing with him. As you know, I played at Georgia. But I don't know Nick, and I'm like, and Troy was like, 
I say, Troy, you, you think we can do this? Are they going to take us from there? They call him my mom and dad saying that we will take care of him. We'll, you know, and we'll make sure he's taken care of. And Troy was like, coach, I, I want to go home. And I just did, you know, so Troy was like, you know, cause we went, we spent. Right. You know, so, so spent, it's the beginning part. And then yeah. now they want to, they saying like, let's leave Indiana. Let's go yeah. to Georgia. Go so to it's Georgia. like, like we, like we born storm and back in the day is like, are yeah. the top talent from this? Let's yeah. go here and see where, how y'all compete with these guys. And he like, no, Troy like, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go. go. So I said, well, I ain't going to go by myself. Cause I always want to have my wing, man. Right. So I, I, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to go, but I would have gotten a chance to actually play against Muxy Bogue if I would have went. They had him at that camp. Uh, I hadn't ran into Spud at that time. You know, I only, mm -hmm. I only saw Spud uh, when I played, uh, was in, when I was at CBA camp in Atlanta. Uh, but um, So even but, just throughout throughout your era, Coach, so do you think that it's kind of, you know, how, how the game is now is like a copycat type league. Do you think that they saw like the small point guard driving the engine, the leader, and everybody said we need to get one of these guys in our program? Like, or how was that landscape? How was remember. it looked at? It? Yeah, but see that that's the that's the thing. Be and when when I came through, Magic Johnson was a six nine point guard. Right. Allen Level, you know, here I am trying to get these pro trials and do all this stuff, and I'm playing against giants. But you know, uh, again, you know, when I go to CBA camp in Atlanta. You know, I get a chance to play in the Pro-Am League. I get a chance to go against Spud and Dominique King Cobra team. I played with Mr. V's figure eight. I scored 24 points, 13 assists, five steals. I'll play Spud, who's now a three-year deal with the with the Atlanta Hawks. So it's all about timing, you know. And at that point, you remember Spud was the littlest guy in the NBA. Muck and uh, uh Muggsy came right Muggsy, after. What's the big guy, the seven footer? Oh. Bo, oh. new Bo, what's the tallest guy in the NBA? So I mean that that was that was marketing, you know, at that time. And you know, right. during my era, little guys didn't make it. It was always the big guys, you know. Um, you know, Ralph Sampson was very close. Ralph was like my guy brother. I mean, every year for my my junior and senior year, me and my brother, and my best friends, we get on the road, we go down to Virginia, we spend time with Big Ralph. Ralph came and worked the slew camp. You know, uh, they showed me going by Ralph dunking a ball. I got a dunk against Big Ralph. Back in the day at Sluke basketball camp. So, you know, I think about all of this, and the, and the little guy always felt this way through, but it was only, it was a, a particular number. Now, now games, I really feel now today, if back in my time, if I can play my style of basketball in today's game, I honestly feel I would destroy these guys. I really feel mm -hmm. those guys that play with me. A teammate of mine, Luther Burton, he could flat score the basketball, went to Beaumont High School could score the basketball, man. Craig Upchurch played at Beaumont High School. Could flat score the basketball. You know, um, the, the game is different. You got a lot of skilled, skilled guys, but I don't know if they are a lot of tough guys. We were right. tough. We were solid. We were tough. Mm -hmm. You know, the Paul Kings that played at Murray, that played at Webster, those guys, these were tough-nosed guys, hard, you know. Um, so I, I just see the game different. I think the kids are a little bit more you know, and, and my thinking is that it got to be a little bit more tougher. You know, it got to be a little bit more so, self-starting too. So, so let's, let's kind of speak to that and, and not in no way, or, you know, we love what's going on with, you know, where the, where the game is right now with the guys that are coming up. The one thing that, you know, when I look at uh, like the NCAA, the transfer portal, as far as, you know, every year, you know, NCAA just came out with a rule basically saying that kids can transfer without being penalized sitting out their year. Uh, kind of speak to that. Do, what, what's your thoughts on, do you think adversity is good as far as sticking it out in the program or when you see any type of, uh, you know, uh, where something may not be going right, do you think that it's best for, for you to leave and try to get a, a fresh start somewhere else? So kind of speak to that in today's game. B, that's kind of a double-edged sword because I, I, I do believe that kids deserve an opportunity if something is not working. Yet, you know, and if it's just not a good fit, it's not a good fit. But the thing that's scary about it is that, you know, you know, we we sometimes spoil our kids, these kids, these prima donnas, these uh, kids that think they've made it before they made it. That's that's the kind of thing that I don't like that I see now where you have these uh, I call them PA parent agents that have an idea that their kid have already already arrived and, 
you know, they, they want to go around and market their kid to every program. You, you know, you're really killing your kid. You know, I, I believe that that's something that uh, organizations need to stand up and be firm about. I, you know, I, I'm not, you know, me personally, if, if, I'm, if I'm ahead of my program and if I feel like I got to cater to a 15, 16, 17 year old kid, last time I checked, I don't need no 15, 16, 17 year old friend. You're going to respect the program. You're going to come out and bust your butt and work because at the end of the day, we're talking about deal. We're, this is bigger than basketball. We're talking about life skills. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of parents milking the system, working in a lot of these programs are submissive to kids like that. If you don't want this number, if you don't want this uniform on, I'm good with that. Let me go find somebody that wants this uniform. And I promise you, when you, you see us, you, it ain't going to be nothing nice. Because I want kids to respect put the work in, earn it. Cause when it's yours, when you earn it, you put the work in and earn it. Can nobody take it from you. But if it's given to you at any point, they can come and take it from you. So I like to teach my kids to earn your key. Cause when it means something to you, that's your pride possession. When you earn it, if it's given to you or you bounce around Mark, to me, that, that, that destroys the character of some kids. Now, some kids fall through the crack and make it. And there's some that, that doesn't, but you know, I just think that we're, we're, we're giving our kids the wrong message by allowing them to think that they are in total control when they shouldn't be. We got to teach them, again, at RCC, that responsibility to charges and consequences. They have to learn those things at a young age. And there's too many coaches and too many programs that, you know, that are, that are selling themselves just to get a kid that's supposed to be good. No, no. I, uh, put the work in. Get in the gym and let's put, like we talked about those Dame Lillards, those Paul George that wasn't those top-notch kids at the time, but they kept their head down, okay? And they put that work in, and at the end, it paid off. I think about Brad Beal. When I first came back from Chicago, and I walk in, uh, Vince Estrada called me and said, Pee Wee, are you going to be in town this weekend? Maybe you can help us with the uh, 17 trials. I was just moving back from Chicago. He didn't even know I was moving back. And I said, yeah, I'll catch okay. said, Vince, but I, I want you to know that I'm actually moving back home. Oh man, that's great, P. Vince has always been a major supporter of mine. And he's like, man, that's great. You come in, you can help us. So I come in the gym and I see this kid, Brad Beal. He has his shirt off. Now I don't know Brad from Adam. I've been in Chicago for 10 years. I saw this kid shooting about the volleyball line beyond the top of the key. And he's knocking him down. And he got his shirt off. I said, he actually had a white beat on. Don't, don't say it wrong. He's had a white beat on. I said, what college that kid go to? He said, college? That kid go to, <laughs> that kid go to uh, Chaminade High School. I said, excuse my friend, shit me. He don't go to high school. Yes, he does. And I'm seeing Brad, thick legs, look formally not, and he's fine. He's letting him go on his jump shot. is pure. And I'm like, wow, skill work. Hours and hours, finding out that he's put hours and hours in the gym with his mom. Not only these other guys, but his mother made sacrifices to see her baby work on skill set. There's pictures I see this image, pictures where I see him in NBA as a little kid, the same body language, turning that corner. You see that. So, you know, I'm like, wow, uh, man, you know, this, this is what it's about. Kids that put that work in, Brad could have went pretty sure programs all over was trying to steal them from right up. Brad stayed right here at home, put that work in. They kept in. Well, he don't have a left hand. I watched that kid go and work on his left hand on high school. Well, he can't do this. He can't do that. And every year you see him just progress. Adding some to his game. Add some to his – all I'm talking about since he's been in the NBA. Now, when he went – because I got him his junior year. Now, that was his senior in high school. He averaged 32, 33, something like that. So, you can't tell me – y'all said he didn't have a left hand. I always noticed that he went to the top right of the court to push with his left hand to make you pay because you said he didn't have a left hand. Then in the NBA, he went through a little injury thing, but when he got solid, look at his ball handling now. I give credit mm -hmm. to, I know Drew Hanlon is a hometown kid that put some work in with him. I had a chance to work with him a couple of times. Corey Frazier had some opportunities. So he's had a lot of people to bless him with some knowledge. But the one thing Brad has always been is self-starting. Same thing right. when you talk about Jason Tatum. Same thing when you talk about Pat McCall. Pat McCall is another kid from my area. His dad, Jeff McCall, put a lot of time and energy in with his son. Okay, and that stuff pays off when you keep your head down and continue to work. Just get in that laboratory and put that work in. So, 
you know, it's, it's just, you know, I just, I just don't like seeing guys when kids have such talent, people marketing them and trying to make them figure they're bigger than the program. Back to our initial stop question. Mm -hmm. Let those kids stay humble. If you need to transfer, that's one thing. But if you're tough minded and if you want to be challenged, buckle down and put the work in if it's sincere. Now, you know, I can tell you anything, Brent. Brian, I can tell you anything. I can tell you I got a million dollars stacked on the floor in front of me. I know if there's a million dollars down here or not. Mm -hmm. You don't know that. But two people I can't fool, the Lord Jesus Christ and myself. If you putting in the work and you busting your butt, if it's tough for you and you just not getting the kids like the jump ship, that's not good. That's not showing, that's, that's not, because we're talking about livelihood now. We're talking about being adults now. We're not just talking about basketball because one day, if you're blessed to have a daughter or a son, are you going to be a quitter? Are you, are you going right. to be a finisher? Are you going to tough it out? you got to teach these kids values. you got to teach them the values of life, not just the basketball score. That's okay. just we, we talk about just dealing with adversity, you know, and at yeah. one point, are you going to say that, you know, I've, I've went through something and I overcame on the other, on the back end and, and you know, and it, it makes yourself feel good to know, like, man, it was, it was tough. You know, life is tough. But being able to overcome some type of adversity, now that becomes your testimony to where now you can speak on it from, you know, a firsthand knowledge and not just saying that, you know, it's going to be like this, but no, we went through it. You went through it. I've went through it. So now know, know that it can come, but you got to be able to go through some type of adversity in order to, to have that reward. So, you know, that, 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 that shot that you hit from spending hours in the gym, you know, you might miss it a couple of times, but you know, if you give it up, then it's that when you hit it, now that's that joy. When you hug your teammate or you hug your coach, they both know, man, you, I mean, he worked on it, you know, and it, and it mean a whole lot. That's when we talk about just championships. I never won a state championship, you know, but at the same time, I can say that I've worked hard like a champion and nobody can take that away from me. And I'm pretty and sure you can say the exact same thing that and nobody, great. no I matter did, what. I never won a state championship. I mean, I, as a freshman, I, we took third with Central as a freshman when I played with Bird Hamilton now. But as, as good as our team was, the way we, we, we destroyed the teams around here, I've never won the state championship. Mm -hmm. Never won it. And this, you know, I, you know Desmet, uh, my senior year, Desmet stopped us. 58-56. Uh, <laughs> I remember it just like it was yesterday. And if we played this met nine more times, we'll beat them by 50. Uh, and they call us when Joe Cannamore, we played CBC and beat them by 30. Joe Cannamore was in the game, twist his ankle. We should have taken him out the game. He stayed there, twist his ankle. He couldn't play. And Donald Davis was asked to go to the five spot and Duck kept running to his original press spot with me. And they got four unmolested layups. This man held the ball the whole game. They knew they couldn't play toe to toe with us. Nobody right. could, but they were smart enough. And I give my high school coach kudos on that, that he held that ball, but they had four unmolested layups and it ended up costing us a two point loss in the dismet game. And I ain't going to talk about those officials with those whistles. We'll smile about that and tease about that later. But, right. uh, <laughs> and then I think, uh, and I, and I say that because it happens and you know, that's something that I would always carry with me, not winning the state championship. Um, but uh, we had some great teams, but you know, it is what it is. So just a couple in closing coach, I'm like, I said, I'm not going to keep you too long. Uh, what, what, what can you say about basketball right now and, and the state of where we are with COVID as far as like, how, how has that impacted you? And then what, what do you see us when we come out of this? What do you, what, what do you foresee the game looking like moving forward? Well, that, you know, the COVID, you know, the, the one thing I would like to share with those that are listening, the COVID is real. Uh, let's not take it for granted. Um, you know, the CDC is asking us to do certain things with, with the mask and thing. And I know it's tough. You know, you know. I mean, I train when I training. My kids wear their mask. I wear my mask. Uh, you know, I spray Lysol. They they laugh and tease with me because I spray Lysol in the air. You know, they they I send them to wash their hands on water breaks and then I come back with hand with sanitizer. Uh, they all use their own individual balls. Uh, so we're trying to do things prevention on the front end to, 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 you know, to keep people healthy and keep everybody safe because I know we all want to get out here and be in the gym. We want things to get close to normalcy as soon as possible. And, uh, but I do know one thing, God has his time for place for everything and everybody. Um, uh, I, I think uh, COVID is not, 
this is, I think COVID exists prior to this. Um, you know, it's just a matter of us now being patient, uh, taking all the health precautions so that we can keep people safe. Uh, the effect that this has on the game, I, again, I, I have my little kids and even my high school guys, coach, it's tough playing in that mask. You know, I know it is, but you got to keep that mask on right now. You know, um, you know, and they've got the arenas now where, you know, there's not that many fans coming in now. Things, you know, the vaccination is, is, uh, is getting out now. You know, they're trying to get that out rapidly as fast as they can so that we can get to close to some form of normalcy as soon as possible. But uh, we can't rush it. Um, right. And we just got to we just gotta fall in line with all the precautions that they're asking us to do. And again, I know it's tough because, I mean, I train kids. I, I was training my little guy son, Chase William last, Will Williams last night, and He's like, Papa, this is tough with this. I say, I know, but, you know, we, we're trying to run. We're trying to get in shape, but we have to be, we have to be safe. So I encourage everybody to really take it serious. Don't take it for granted. Uh, and don't think about yourself. Think about that other person next to you. Uh, right. and, and, and that's vice versa. They need to think about you. And I know that people feel, you know, you hear people saying, you know, I have a right, I don't want to, you know, but, you know, you have a right to also do what's right. And that is protect yourself as well as others. So, you know, I pray that that message stays clear and, and people really take heed to it. Mm -hmm. All right. And then so and then just it, real quick, if you can just kind of speak on the Billikens, the Billikens program, like you've done so much with, with still, you know, giving back to the game and being around the game. Speak to your alma mater. You know, what do you see the, the team for right now as far as, you know, where we stand, even with the NCAA precautions and then uh, uh, some things, you know, moving forward. What, you know, what do you feel like uh, you want to see, uh, like I said, even with the with the game? Uh, within itself moving forward. So speaking to on, on the Billikens program and then speaking to uh, pushing the game forward also. Well, you know, speaking of my alma mater, St. Louis University, I, I'm very proud to say uh, I'm a part of that. I think uh, my son, you know, and I could have spoke on him. I call him my son and he knows it. It's Corey Tate. Um, I was blessed to coach Corey at a young age. Uh, I remember and Earl Austin Jr. was very responsible for coming to me and telling me in the Eagles program back then we were St. Louis Eagles, which is BBE now. Uh, hey, Pee Wee, we got a kid that's at Pattonville that's that's pretty good. We may want to take a look at him. And um, mm -hmm. I'm speaking about Corey because he's the associate head coach at St. Louis University now. Um, and uh, I said, you know, this kid, he said, yeah. And the kid came out and he was phenomenal. Uh, and, you know, I saw a six four, six five kid I mean, he coached you at Mental Area. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, I saw a guy that had such skill set, had an IQ for the game, uh, could score the basketball. Um, and he, like I said, he's like a son to me. Uh, I think St. Louis University have had some great coaches in the past. Uh, Coach uh, Coach Ford, Travis Ford is a, a very good guy. You know, we've become very good friends. Um, you know, we've been blessed to have a kid that I call my son, Jordan Goodwin, who could have went anywhere, in, you know, had options to go anywhere in the country, but he stayed home uh, and, and played here at St. Louis University. We talk about Yuri, your kid that played. Yuri had Iowa at the last hour. All these universities were trying to get these kids. Yuri decided, I'm going to stay home and make a difference for my home team. Fred Thatch, you know, Tulsa, everyone wanted him. Hey, Fred said, you know what? I'm going to stay in St. Louis and be able to make a difference for our St. Louis team. And then we got T.J. Hargrove, a an athlete from East Side. Eastside has put out and then he has a lot of individual talent over there. TJ decided to say, I'm gonna stay home and and I'm gonna fight through and I'm gonna make I'm gonna make things work for me at St. Louis University. And as a result, we build our program with our local kids that are talented. That's a future. We all get a chance selfishly at our home home base, get a chance to watch these kids grow and nurture and develop as basketball players. What a good coach that gives them an opportunity. Nobody's perfect, you know. Uh, I know everybody has an opinion about things, but I think Coach Ford does a great job of, of getting what he can out of the talent that we have. Um, you know, uh, I selfishly would love to see all our St. Louis kids, let St. Louis University be that team. They don't, you don't have to go to Duke to be an NBA player. We see right. that. Talk about a Jai Laurent, you know. You don't have to go to those big-time schools. And now you're watching these mid-level schools. Now they're competing just and, and they're beating on these big-time top five schools. So it's just not about going somewhere that fits you to the point you talked about earlier, these kids going, uh, 
pop and jump and ship. You don't want to be in a situation where you go somewhere and then you feel like you got to leave and you got to hop here, then you got to hop here. I know the NCAA do COVID giving the kids an opportunity to get a year back. Uh, they also give you a chance to have one transferring year. I think that's a good thing uh, because mm -hmm. I feel like a kid have a right. I mean, the NCAA uh, has its rules, but I think players still should have some kind of freedom or some reluctance. If they choose to do something different, we should, they shouldn't be penalized, you know, but the NCAA games are still being played. They're not penalized. So mm -hmm. give the kids a little freedom. I do respect that part of, of the NCAA that has come, come into fruition. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I love what I think the Billikens are doing, you know. Um, and that, like I said, they're fun to watch. You know, they were in the top 22. We dropped one today, but we'll be right back. Trust me, they'll be back on track. They'll they'll be a team to reckon with because they, you know, Coach Ford got them playing hard. They're tough-minded. And, uh, you know, talking to my son last night, he's like, Coach, we're going to rock. I'm, we're going we're gonna to put this mm -hmm. thing on all of our shoulders and we're going to carry this horse. We're going to roll. And I'm like, well, that's what I want to hear. So they played tonight against LaSalle. So I, I'll be zoned in to watch. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and for the future of, of uh, uh, you asked me, what was the second question again? You asked me about. No, no, it was just the, 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 the state of the game. You kind of, you, you kind of pretty much just answered it as far as like, uh, uh, what, what I would like to see as far as with the, the local talent, you know, at least and having St. Louis right. U as, right. as an option and not, you know, venture out. And, and we all love to, to say that we, we was recruited by this team or recruited by this coach and this That's person. Fine. But at the same time, it's just like, you know, after you finish and you, you get that degree, you know, a lot of times you have to look at it. We talk about just relationships. After all these years, I still have a relationship with you. I still have a relationship with all of my coaches as far as coming up. And I want to make sure that kids understand that, that, you know, you have relationships with, with folks well after you get through playing and you have to look at that, you know, well, yeah, will I continue to have a relationship with somebody if, if I don't pursue to live in, in some of these, you know, towns with these big schools, or am I going to, you know, be rooted here in St. Louis and kind of have my branches kind of spread out with the relationship that I've already built over all of my years playing sports. So you know, that's a good, you know what, Brown, and I'm glad you stated that because, you know, I think about uh, uh, a kid, you know, some of the kids that we've had from St. Louis. I mean, Jahidi White now, I'm blessed to coach his son. Jahidi's like my son. Um, his sons uh, play play with me with my Magic organization. They're still part of BBE. Uh, old Jahidi Jr. is. Uh, mm -hmm. But I say that because these kids, they, they decide to go off. Jahidi went to Georgetown. You know, he has a lot of connections in those areas, but that's not home. You know, Chris Carrollwell, that played at Duke, decided not to come back. Never against him. We're going to always love him and embrace him here as our home body. Absolutely. You know, and we look at a guy like Corey Tate, using those three as an example. Corey Tate coached at Mental Area for 15 years. Grassroots interface in these communities, touching these kids, touching those states to recruit out of Chicago and Springfield in those areas, get out these St. Louis kids. And then you still have a relationship. Those relationship because that ball will one day stop bouncing absolutely yeah. you know you got to get that degree you know you want to have something to fall back on you want to have relationships where people will give you opportunities you know to go into the corporate world to to go into whatever it is that you would like to be building relationships are key and having them in your home base where you're from if that's where you choose to come back that's key so it's bigger than just the basketball we're talking about your life skills things that comes in after basketball, because that ball going, it's going to stop bouncing. It doesn't bounce for me anymore. The relationships I've learned, all the trials and tribulations I've been through through my life, you know, I'm, I don't, I, I, I deal with them head on. I don't run from them, you know, and I'm just thankful to God that people have always looked at me as a character kind of guy, a good guy, and I've never been judged by him. So those blessings really come in, come in handy when you need them. And there's nothing like someone saying, hey, I remember you. Hey, you want to get a chance to coach my kid? There's a lot of guys that I coach, just like yourself. Like I just told you, Jahidi, who I coached. And now I'm coaching his kids. You know what I'm saying? Corey yeah. Tate, Sebastian. Now I'm training his son. Those are, those are moments that means more to me than anything. You know, where you can come back and you feel comfortable enough to say, hey, this is the guy that gave me some direction that helped me. I'm going to give you that same guy. I'm going to give my son to him. And Chip Walter, I, I think about Chip and, and his dad, Rocky, who has been tremendous in my life. I got a chance to train his son and his daughter, who's the top 
tennis player for the last two years in the St. Louis area, trained her in basketball. Now she branched off to tennis. So you think about all those things and think about all the lives you touched as we talked about earlier. And those are your blessings, man. Those are things that you cherish and you're thankful about. And, and me having an opportunity to coach you, Brian, you've always been a class guy, stand-up guy. You've always been a hard worker and you've always been a fair young man. And I want to thank you for the opportunity of coming on your show and speaking with you today. It means a lot to me. I know I was kind of rough on you there for a minute because I, I was just getting through things. But, you know, nah, I nah. thank you for being patient. I thank you for the opportunity to, to be presented on your show today. Man, I appreciate you, coach, man. I love you, man. I, I, man, like I said, all these years, man, from just seeing me grow up, man, you put the battery in my back. And just, you know, just te just teaching me the game, just, you know, like you said, it, it's about relationships. It's about, you know, and I, I look at the, the longevity part, you know, uh, mental health is a big thing now uh, as far as that we all deal with, you know, the stress from, you know, even having, you know, family members that, you know, call on you for different things. And then you have, you have a nucleus of your family that you, you, you counted on. And then not to mention that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we all have teams, players, and coaches that people, you know, want information from. And, you know, you have to make sure that, you know, you taking care of yourself. You have to make sure that you keeping your mental health intact, because I think that's going to be the key to just longevity. Um, and like you said, you didn't put so many years into this. And so just the last thing, can you just speak on that? Just the, the longevity part with the mental health and making sure that, you know, we, we keep everything intact in and not get too stressed out because at, at the end of the day, it's a game, but it's not. It is a game. Yeah. You, know, you, you have a lot of, I mean, that's very important. Keeping sanity, being, you know, staying, staying sane. You know, a lot of times, especially being a coach, especially being a competitive coach, you can stress yourself to a point where, you know, you know, everybody likes perfection. Everybody wants to be that guy. Everybody wants to be great. And that's where I say, uh, but that's why when they talk about staff, there's pieces of the puzzle. Somebody strong in this area, somebody got to be strong in that area. You got to have somebody build you up in this area because you don't have it all. It's like when you talk about love, and loving a uh, uh, loving a person more than one loving more than one person you have three or four kids you love more than one person because you love all your kids it it takes pieces of that puzzle to fit you know and the stress level that comes with coaching because you want to win sometimes losing is winning as long as you're learning people don't understand that i'm a firm believer of that that's where the humility come in Am I competitive? I don't think you'll find another com person more competitive than me in this world because I, I love to compete. Now, I'm going to compete. I didn't say I'm going to win. I didn't say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compete. As long as you compete, I'm good. But you must compete. And having pieces, you know, where you, uh, people around you that can take, take added stress from you, if you have somebody that's good with post guys, add that person to you. Trust that person. Become a team. If you got somebody that's good with teaching uh, guards shooting skill. If bring that around you because you can't do it all. And that stress level is unbelievable when you try to take all this on yes. yourself. And as high school coaches, you know, I, you know, sometimes, you know, you have guys that have really played the game sometimes and there's some high school coaches have never played the game. They're math teachers. It's a difference. When you're a competitive guy, you're thinking about one thing and one thing only, winning. When I think about the uh, one of the kids I coach, Real fast is Justin over at CBC, who's Tatum's dad. Justin has always been a tough-minded, tough guy. But Justin has gotten to the point now that he's bringing people around him to kind of take a little bit of that responsibility off of him, relief it off his shoulder because Justin, he likes to push. He's a pusher. Ryan Johnson, who's now at Cardinal Ritter. Yourself at St. Mary's. You guys have always been one that's been competitive, but you got to find people around you can take a little bit of that stress off you and realize at the end of the day is just a game. And you don't want to stress yourself out because you want to be here because you have children, you have family, you have loved ones that care about you too. So you got to balance it off. It's a balance, but you got to balance it off. And that's gold, Coach.